Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Records Managers Online Forum. Uh, my name is Martin Killian. I'm the Executive Director of State Records New South Wales and also the Director of Collections at Museums of History New South Wales. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to our October forum. Uh, it's a bumper number of people that we're expecting at today's forum with uh, around 250 registrations uh, for the forum itself. I'd like to start the forum by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're uh, all meeting today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. For me, uh, based in the Sydney CBD, uh, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to extend uh, that acknowledgement and pay a particular welcome to any First Nations people who are attending at the forum this morning. In particular, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague Gulwen Yang Moran. Uh, Gulwen Yang has just joined us as our manager of the First Nations Community Access to Archives project. Um, you'll be hearing more about that in the months and weeks to come. Uh, but um, welcome particularly to you, Bill and Yang, uh, for this uh, Records Managers Forum. Uh, there's a few housekeeping matters uh, just to run through before we get underway. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, people's cameras and microphones have been uh, disabled uh, by us as part of the session to save on bandwidth and to ensure our presentations run smoothly. Um, so your camera is on at any stage, if you could please be aware that the forum um, is being recorded, uh, first of all. Um, and if you do leave your camera on and, and you experience any connection issues, um, you might like to turn the camera off as a uh, first start um, to, to resolve any issues that you might have. Um, we've also turned on live captioning uh, for information accessibility purposes uh, for this morning's session. And as I said, the forum will be recorded um, and will be available on the State Records website. Um, and anyone who has registered for the forum this morning will receive an email uh, notifying them that the recording has been uploaded. As with always, with our Records Managers Forum, there'll be plenty of time for questions uh, throughout the forum. We are asking you uh, wherever possible to use the chat function. Uh, to ask your questions or make any comments um, or provide any feedback. We will come to that chat uh, at the end of each session um, and we'll deal with any questions and comments at the end of each presenter's part of today's Records Managers Forum. Uh, we'll also, if you raise your hands, if you prefer to ask a question verbally, if you raise your hand, then we will um, turn your camera on um, at that point. Uh, we've got a fairly action-packed uh, agenda for today's forum. Uh, you can now see that on your screen. Uh, the first is a short section uh, where I'm going to show you our good record keeping animation video. Uh, that's, I'll go into more detail on that in a few minutes. Uh, then we have uh, a session on the state of record keeping in New South Wales presented by uh, my colleague Catherine Robinson. Uh, and that is as a result of this year's uh, record keeping monitoring exercise. So providing you with an overview of those results. Then handing to Christy Tabiri from Museums of History, New South Wales, to talk about uh, work that has been happening this year uh, and that will uh, continue next year in terms of implementing the access and transfer uh, requirements of the State Records Act. We then have a session uh, by Elizabeth Hadlow, our Head Conservator, um, on the preservation of records and providing you with both some practical tips in terms of preservation of records, but also um, some sort of expectations around uh, records and particularly those records being transferred into the State Archives Collection. Um, I'll then be handing to Laura Baldwin, the Manager of State Records, for some State Records updates. Uh, and we'll then uh, follow that by a general question and answer session um, and we'll wrap up uh, the event. Uh, we will be uh, finishing the event by 12 o'clock at the very latest. 
uh, depending on the discussion and the questions that uh, are asked, uh, we may finish a little earlier. But uh, the purpose of the forum, of course, is to have uh, good discussion uh, and for you to resolve any questions that you might have. So uh, don't feel uh, constrained in any way uh, by any time restrictions. If you've got a question, uh, please do answer it. All right, so let's get underway. Uh, one of the first things that we want to do is to show you um, a, a new initiative uh, from us at State Records New South Wales, uh, which is the production of an animation video. It's intended to be a short uh, two to three minute video, which provides an overview of uh, record keeping and record keeping obligations within public offices. Uh, everything from uh, sort of CEO to operational level. And fundamentally, it's aimed at uh, really conveying uh, in simple, uh, uh, concise, in a simple and concise way, um, the importance of good record keeping in public offices. Um, and as I said, it's designed for a wide range of users. Um, so for new staff coming into your public offices, this would be appropriate um, for your chief executive uh, to uh, the um, uh, to extol uh, the, the um, benefits of good record keeping. This would be a great um, animation video to uh, show at, for example, an all staff meeting. Um, if as a result of uh, the showing you know, in a minute or so of the video, you'd like to get a copy of the video for your own purposes, please do contact us at State Records. It is available on our website and available on YouTube. Um, so you are also able to stream it live from YouTube. Uh, so without further ado and a drum roll, uh, I'll get us to play the animation video, please. Working to deliver better programs and services is the commitment we make to the people of New South Wales every day. The New South Wales Government is increasingly delivering services digitally and therefore requires appropriate organisation and storage of information. Behind the scenes, there is an essential element helping us achieve this – good record keeping. Having a record of all actions, events and decisions is crucial for delivering quality services to the people and communities of our state. Good record keeping is the backbone of good information governance. It empowers us to make data informed decisions to help manage risk, save money and protect citizens rights and entitlements. But above all, good record keeping ensures transparency for all government policies and decisions now and into the future. Once they leave business use, records identified as having enduring value become part of the State Archives collection. So what does good record keeping look like? For public office employees like Juanita, it means making and saving a record of all her work related activities. Records can be in any format and from any source. If one isn't automatically made, Juanita does so manually, like after conversations or meetings. To get better at record keeping, Juanita can utilise local resources tailored to her organisation or speak to someone from her records management team. Like Simon, who is a records and information manager. They support their organisation's record systems to ensure that all information is captured accurately. To learn more, Simon can subscribe to newsletters or attend forums from State Records New South Wales to network with other experts in their field. As a chief executive, good record keeping systems allow Sabrina to deliver better business outcomes for her organisation's customers and stakeholders. Sabrina works closely with Senior Responsible Officer, Mark, and the Records and Information Management team to ensure all official business is managed appropriately and that all records are safe. Mark ensures records are only disposed of or destroyed when authorised. He completes an annual report assessing the organisation's record-keeping performance, which provides insights into where they can improve. 
Mark also oversees the transfer of records that have enduring value to the State Archives collection. To become better record keepers, Mark can access resources and guidance from State Records New South Wales, as well as draw on support from his team. While Sabrina can receive briefings from State Records New South Wales and attend executive forums to collaborate with other chief executives. No matter what our role is in a public office, we are all record keepers who have a role to play. State Records New South Wales helps public officers to develop the capability and expertise to implement and maintain mature record keeping systems. To learn more about how to improve your record keeping, visit staterecords.newsouthwales.gov.au. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you, Gulwinyan, for uh, the, um, the comment on that. Um, I've, we've had a question here from David around the useful training resources on the old world website, and whether they'll be brought over and made available on the new site. Um, David, there is certainly a commitment on our part to um, have training uh, and resources and guidance available to you um, in public offices to make sure that you're able to both do your jobs, but also not only your jobs, but also to um, do your jobs in terms of advocacy for record keeping and records management in your organisation. And that includes um, potentially training and um, uh, awareness of other people. Uh, we're working away currently uh, at uh, revising the content of our website. Um, we also have um, a strong uh, preference to update a lot of the training work and have some e-learning modules on our new website. Um, and we've sort of briefed, uh, we've scoped that out um, and we'll look at uh, doing that uh, resourcing uh, 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 you know, dependent. Uh, but it's certainly a commitment to do that. So I hope that answers the, your question there. All right, um, I'd now like to introduce Catherine Robinson, who, uh, as many of you all know, is uh, one of our senior project officers at State Records. And Catherine will be presenting on the state of record keeping in New South Wales, which is sort of the, uh, the summing up of the results of our record keeping monitoring exercise, uh, which a large number of you participated in um, earlier this year. So Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Martin. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, the first slide in my slide deck um, provides some background information, particularly for those who aren't familiar with the record keeping monitoring exercise. So each year, State Records New South Wales conducts a monitoring exercise. The authority for this is Section 12.4 of the State Records Act, which requires each public office to report on its records management program to State Records New South Wales. Now, the monitoring exercise is your way of meeting this obligation. Um, as many of you will be aware, um, the public officers complete an assessment um, of their records management program using the RMAT and then submit this assessment to us. Um, as the assessment outcomes are scored, we can provide each public office with an overall score out of five for their maturity and compliance with the State Records Act. These scores are available now in your organisation's assessment response in the service portal. And on behalf of State Records New South Wales, I would like to say a big thank you to all the public officers for their cooperation and, and participation in this year's record keeping monitoring exercise. So many thanks to the 278 public officers that participated. Well done, guys. Thank you. Um, so State Records New South Wales has pulled together all the results from the monitoring exercise and we've published a new report on the website, the state of record keeping in New South Wales. It provides an overview of the monitoring exercise and the aggregate summary results for each question. The results can be used to benchmark against the rest of the, the jurisdiction or the participating public offices um, or by public office type. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the results and comments from public officers will also assist us in prioritising our efforts for assistance and guidance during this upcoming year.
Um, and there's the URL if you haven't already had a chance to have a look at the report. Okay, this year's results provide us with the second year of data and further understandings about how the jurisdiction of the State Records Act is um, performing. So that jurisdiction is the agencies, authorities, departments, local government councils, universities, state-owned corporations and local health districts. These are all um, public office types. Um, so um, the findings that we have are on the slide here. Um, one of my little green arrows seems to have gone for a little walk to the left. Um, anyway, the findings identify overall that there have been improvements in records management uh, uh, maturity across the jurisdiction. So we have an increased rate of participation. So 278 public officers up from 247 last year. Um, which is a response rate of 74% up from 65% last year. And I'll note that the, the public officers that didn't participate in the monitoring exercise have been identified for the first time. Um, these public officers are listed at Appendix A of the report. The results identify that 38% of participating public officers are mature in their records management. This means that they're scoring um, a level three or above out of five um, in their overall maturity score. And now this is up from 30% last year. So we're seeing the increase in maturity. Um, and overall, the maturity score for the jurisdiction is 2.79 out of five, which is up from 2.67 last year. We now have five assessment questions that are above the baseline compliance of three or as sitting at three and above. Um, and I've listed those questions on the slide for you. And the three lowest assessment questions are question eight on outsourcing and contracts, question nine on performance monitoring, and question 18 on transfer to the state archives collection. Okay. So the overall maturity score for each public office, uh, the overall maturity score is 2.79 out of five. Now, this graph actually shows the overall scores by public office type. So you'll be able to see on here what um, the rest of your um, organisation, similar organisations are achieving. So if you're an agency, then this year um, the agencies scored 2.77 overall. So agencies, councils and local health districts have actually improved this year. State-owned corporations and universities have had a bit of a correction and a slight decrease. We believe that some of the changes in the overall maturity score could be due to um, some reassessment um, and re-evaluation of where an organisation is actually sitting on the levels of maturity. And this might reflect, a, this year might reflect a more accurate um, result from um, organisations. Now, I should also note that all the graphs that I'm using in this presentation are available in the report online. So you have access to these graphs straight away um, via the website. As you're aware, the records management assessment tool can be divided up into three big sections or topic categories. So people and governance, systems and business and information management. So the 19 questions are actually allocated into each of these categories. So here's the results for this year. As you'll see, each of the categories has also increased in its level of maturity, um, which is a great result to see. Um, and just for those of you who are dead keen to see the results for the whole 19 questions, there they are. Um, as you'll see, there has been sort of subtle changes. So this year is um, shown in dark blue and uh, you'll see that there are improvements for most questions or sort of almost at a similar level to last year. So definitely things are moving up. Now, in the report, we've provided information and results for each question of the Records Management Assessment Tool, the RMAT. On the slide, I've included the two different types of graphs that you'll see in the report. So on the left-hand side is the graph for that we use for each question. It shows the results of that question. You'll see the overall score right down the bottom for that question, what the overall maturity score is. Um, and for question one this year, it was 2.9. And then you'll see the results by public office types. So once again, you can benchmark against how your type of public office has actually a um, uh, 
answered this particular question. So if you're a council, you can look at the council results. If you're a state-owned corporation, you can compare yourself with other state-owned corporations. And I'll just call out that the local health districts um, are doing very, very well in this particular area. Um, they're, they're the best performing public office type for this question. Now, um, the graph on the right hand side shows how public officers actually responded to this question. So it, it's completely de-identified, but it gives you an understanding of the spread of results. So it shows you how many public officers were scoring one, how many were scoring a two, how many were scoring three, etc. Um, you can use this graph also to do benchmarking. So you can understand where your organisation is placed in the responses and how many other organisations are scoring similar to you. Um, to your organisation. So is your organisation in the group that's scoring 137? Um, are you amongst that 137 or are you sitting in one of the other, the other groups? Um, so another process that you can do to benchmark where you're actually sitting overall. Okay, from this year, State Records is also preparing a scorecard um, for each public office that participated in the rec record keeping monitoring exercise. The scorecard will provide a snapshot of the assessment results and, in, and provide a comparison with the jurisdiction results. The scorecards will be sent out to the chief executive and the senior responsible officer for each public office. And we hope to start getting those out um, before the end of this week. Okay, so what's next? Um, the next monitoring exercise will be held during March and into early April next year. Um, so please put those dates in your diaries. Um, the submissions like this year will be made via the Surface portal. Um, and we will be sending out communications to all public officers before the 2024 monitoring exercise starts. So don't worry, we will be in contact with you probably at least twice before um, it all sort of starts next year. So what can you do to prepare for next year? Um, these are my top tips. I'd be reviewing this year's assessment and doing some benchmarking against um, other public officers, whether it's the same type of public office or the jurisdiction, to understand how your organisation is actually performing in relation to others in the jurisdiction. Um, have a look at what work you've been doing over this year to improve performance. Um, identify that work and make sure you've got that listed so that you can incorporate that into your assessment for next year because um, nothing's worse than not recognising that you've actually done work this year but you haven't actually increased your maturity level because you forgot to include something. So remember to include this year's improvement works into next year's assessment. Um, you will also be identifying work that needs to be done to improve gaps in conformity and maturity. Um, and these items need to be included into your records management strategy because obviously some of them can't be completed in um, one year. They may require additional resources, et cetera, and take more than um, 12 months to undertake. But make sure you've updated your records management strategy to include these items. And lastly, remember to identify the evidence that supports the level of maturity you have chosen in your assessment. This is really important because that the assessment is an evidence-based assessment process. Um, whilst you're doing it as a self-assessment exercise, there is always the possibility that we could ask you or others could ask you, what's the evidence that actually supports the maturity level that you've actually chosen? Um, what's your basis or justification for choosing level whatever? Um, so um, those are my top tips for getting ready for next year. Um, now, if you have any questions about the record keeping monitoring exercise, either this year's or next year's, feel free to get in contact with us at the email address. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that might be out there. Great. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of comments in the questions, uh, but I'm sure just while people are warming up their fingers to on their keyboards to ask any questions. Um, I just wanted to publicly uh, acknowledge your efforts and thank you for all of your work um, in the record keeping monitoring exercise. Um, this isn't an easy exercise for any single agency, but um, it's a much larger exercise for a whole jurisdiction uh, for us to do, and you very much led that work. 
Um, and I do want to publicly thank you for that. And I can see a little applauses and um, thumbs up. Uh, Thanks, everyone. On my screen, so well done, you. So thank you very much. A um, couple of comments. So Shannon has said, uh, if you don't identify all high risk, high value records, it's very difficult to honestly score a bar or two um, mm. in many of those following questions. Um, and Joe has made a related comment about um, when there's high risk, high value uh, records you, you produce and enter data into systems, but then you're not responsible for the management of those systems and that falls in another department. And so who's ultimately responsible for the records? Did you want to comment on both of those? Um, it comes back to, in terms of Joe's question, it'll come back to the business owners. So the business owner of the system is ultimately responsible for the records in the system um, because they own the system and that needs to be made clear through policy and business rules. Um, obviously, record keeping professionals need to have an input into that policy and business rule to ensure that obviously everything's covered off as part of the um, formal requirements there. But yes, Part of setting up responsibility is also um, covering off on transparency and visibility of what's actually happening in those systems. So I think it's something that needs to be worked through within each organisation that, yes, you are responsible for these. This is yours. Um, you are the system owner, but I need visibility of this in order to um, do this um, particular assessment exercise each year. I think that's mm. a, the straightforward way. Um, in terms of the first question, could you just repeat that for me again in terms so, of? Sure. So Shannon's asked, really commenting that if you haven't identified all your high risk, high value, Correct. Um, it's very difficult to honestly score over over two um, in, in the questions that relate yeah. to that. Yeah, and, and this relates to the fact that we have prioritised high risk, high value and the importance of these particular critical records to your organisation, but also to the state. And um, if they haven't been identified, then it makes it very difficult to obviously um, put the controls and other management regimes around those records further down, which is why, yes, the... Um, questionnaire actually is prejudiced to or biased, I should say, um, towards having identified all the high risk, high value right up front. So then you can actually do the good things with it mm. uh, or do the good things to it, I should say, um, as you go along. Yeah, and I guess it's, um, I, I'm sure uh, everyone here uh, in this session would be wanting to identify their high risk, high value mm. records. Um, I think Joe's, similar to Joe's comment, it's the difficulty of um, sort of uh, getting awareness, getting uh, being part of the conversation mm. around those high risk, high value records for a number of our colleagues in public offices. And I'd also just pop two cents in there about a lot of your high risk, high value will also have been identified as part of your um, cyber security attestation processes. Um, so um, you need to obviously have conversations with your cybersecurity team um, because you're both working towards a similar goal. Um, obviously, they're wanting to protect the particular assets. You need to know what those assets are so that they can obviously be managed from a record keeping perspective. So um, looking at don't reinvent the wheel, keep working together with um, a number of groups in your own organisations who are identifying the same kinds of things. Yeah, the crown jewels. Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Great. Any other questions or comments from anyone before we move on? No? All right. Well, thanks again. Okay. Uh, uh, wait. Uh, Thank so, you. wait. Tony has uh, commented about some additional guidance from us uh, could assist in promoting the importance of managing business systems data as records. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, Tony. We will take that on board um, when we sort of. Uh, continuing to look at uh, the guidance um, that we are providing uh, to, to the jurisdiction for sure. So thank yeah. you for that suggestion. Uh, for the techies, yes, indeed. Yeah. All right, thanks again, Catherine. Uh, let's move on to our next session, uh, which is being presented by Christy Tabiri. Uh, Christy, as many of you already know, is our Senior Advisor in Agency Services at Museums of History, New South Wales. Christy has a long history 
uh, with the former State Archives and Records Authority, having worked with the State Archives Collection, and uh, many of you will know her uh, through her years in the Government Records Repository. Uh, Christy has been uh, instrumental in leading uh, the implementation of the access and transfer provisions uh, that will both come into play on the 1st of January uh, next year. Um, and in particular, with a focus this last uh, 12 months during 2023 on the access provisions and ensuring that there's appropriate arrangements made uh, for access to state records. And then we'll move into uh, the transfer, transfer provision uh, requirements next calendar year. So Christy, over to you, please. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. Um, OK, so we're sort of splitting this part of the presentation. Just um, looking back at what we've done um, in terms of the um, changes, the transition period we've had for the changes to the State Records Act. Um, our focus this year has obviously been on the changes to public access to state records because that has been a risk and records do default to open on the 1st of January 2024. But there is also the additional requirement for transfer plans to be submitted. So um, the majority of our communication this year has been focused around the changes to public access. Um, as you can just see in this timeline here, it sort of just lays out um, our approach to this over this calendar year. Um, so the State Records Act was amended on the 31st of December 2022 and State Records New South Wales and Museums of History New South Wales um, both commenced as separate entities, um, but the changes we're talking about don't actually commence until the 1st of January 2024. They did have a deferral period. So obviously we spent most of the first half of this year um, hosting information sessions, sessions with different public office clusters, groups of universities, groups of local government networks, um, we tried to work our way around to everyone. Um, I think at last count there was 391 public offices across the jurisdiction. So um, trying to reach out to everyone. Um, we did have the presentation of the access direction tool at the in-person records managers forum in March 2023, which I know a lot of you weren't able to attend because it was on site at Kingswood. Um, there was email communications from the Chief Operating Officer out to all senior responsible officers in April, reminding them that the changes were coming and that action needed to be taken. I did host a couple of live webinars um, demonstrating the Access Direction tool that's available on the portal um, in May and June, and we have got a recorded version on the website for people to refer to if they're unsure. Um, and then this, you know, from the start of this financial year, so from July, through to September, we really have been doing targeted engagement with outstanding public officers and those with um, records where we consider there's a risk to those records defaulting to open. Um, many of you would have received an email on the 19th of October from our Director of Collections, just sort of um, reminding you that action needed to be taken. Um, so at the moment, we've actually got a flurry of responses from people and um, people going into the portal and actually renewing and registering new access directions, which is fantastic. We really appreciate that. So thanks all. Um, for those who have not responded to that email, there will be another escalation email going out mid-November. So this is just a heads up. Um, and then we have got the deadline to register access directions on the 8th of December 2023. So that will give us time before Christmas shutdown to make sure that everything's up to date, all the systems have been updated and um, nothing hopefully will inadvertently default to open on the 1st of January 2024. So that's our process so far. Um, but I know a lot of you have been asking about the new requirement for transfer plans. So the second part of this presentation, if you could go to the next slide, please, Irene. OK, so I'm actually going to do a demonstration of the prototype transfer plan um, that we've built in the service portal for you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, this is a prototype at the moment because it, we are still waiting for the regulations to commence for the State Records Act. Um, but this prototype is available in the portal for people to have a look at, have a play with. Um, 
like I said, our focus for 2023 has been managing the risk to the changes to public access to state records. Um, but the, this new requirement is going to be our focus for 2024. So if you're sort of sitting there worried that you haven't heard much about it and there's this there's this new requirement that you don't really know a lot about, um, this is my chance to sort of show you what our thinking is, um, what we're asking public officers to do, and just show you how to, to do that. Um, so I'm in the portal now. You should all be able to see that. Um, I'm logged in as myself, as a member of Museums of History in New South Wales. So you can see here, if we go into the transfer plan tab, we have got this advisory up here. When it went live, we were sort of asking for feedback on the 30, before the 31st of July. And thank you for those of you who did. Some people did provide some useful feedback. Um, and that submissions won't be required um, until 2024. And you don't need to worry that you need to have it ready on the 1st of January 2024 when um, that new requirement does commence. Um, we actually have the whole calendar year of 2024 for people to submit their transfer plans. So the first thing you'll do is go into create a transfer plan and you'll create a new one. So our first step is um, to give it a name, we've got these little information hovers that will sort of indicate what we suggest you call it. Um, it needs to be something meaningful for yourselves, obviously. Um, in order to avoid my usual spelling disasters, I have copy and pasted one this time, which are those of you who um, have seen me do presentations know that my typing on the live is not great. Um, start date and end date. Um, we're just suggesting that you put in the first of the first 2024 through to the 31st of the 12th, 2028. Um, obviously, this will change. The transfer plans are expected to be on a five yearly cycle, so it's not going to be an annual exercise like the records monitoring exercise is run by state records. This is more of a five year check in with us um, in line with the regulations being issued for the State Records Act. Description is not mandatory. You can put something in if you like. Um, I have got some text here just to show you what you can put in. So you can sort of just say to us, you know, this is a point in time and we're going to keep adding to it if you'd like to, um, or you could make it a description for yourselves if it's meaningful. You hit next. Um, it does ask you who the authorising officer is. So as usual with everything in the portal, you can click and it will bring up all the contacts. So I might select Mr Killian for this one. Um, if that person doesn't appear as a contact who's already been given access or been used to authorise something in the portal, you can click this box and put their details in. I'll just go with Martin for the moment. Okay, and so then what we're asking is to tell us what records you know that you have that are required to state archives. Um, I will emphasise this is just for the material that is um, required as state archives and disposal authorities. We have had some people a bit worried that we're asking you to report on all of your records and what you're planning on doing with them. This is just planning for the transfer of those records that have been um, identified as required as state archives in your current disposal authorities. So first up, I'm going to do a physical transfer. And it asks you what sort of format the records are. So I might say that this is volumes. Um, an estimated date of transfer. So please indicate an estimated date that they'll be transferred into the State Archives collection. Obviously, it can't be in the past. We're not asking you to report on activities you've already done. Um, it doesn't have to be an exact date. I've been suggesting to people when they've asked about it, maybe an end of financial year or an end of a calendar year as your target. So I might say, I want to submit this by 2020, 2025. Um, and that will just give you a target to aim for and it will give us an idea of um, your thinking of transferring at that point in time. Um, the current location, so you've got a few options. Third party is um, Zerco data, um, Grace Records Management, Government Records Repository, that sort of storage facility. Offsite is if you have a um, another storage facility that you manage yourself or if you've got um, an external site for your agency, if you're a local council and you have records stored in the depot, for example. Onsite is if it's in your office or a regional archive centre such as um, 
CSU at Wagga or um, UNE at Armadale. I'm going to say that this is offsite. Um, and the condition. So we are trying to use this tool to get an, uh, an idea of what's actually out there. At the moment, we're very reactive to transfers into the collection. We don't actually have an overview of everything that's required as a state archive and what's endured and what's with public offices. This is a way for us to actually start to get some of that information. And as a result, we're also asking for the condition of the records. So we'd rather be given a heads up um, if they've been water damaged or mouldy, if they've been um, infected by silverfish or eaten by mice during mice plagues, um, if the condition's overall good, vinegar syndrome applies to AV record sets. Um, I'm going to say that um, this one is just other damage. And then the physical meter quantity, the physical quantity is just in meterage. Um, we toyed with the idea of asking for, tell us how many boxes you've got, um, but we realized that everybody has different boxes that they use. So we just decided to land on a estimate of shelves and none of this is set in stone. This is just an estimate for us. So, um, so an estimate for that is fine. So I might just say that I've got um, two shelves worth of this. And then a description. It's a broad description of the records. The information little hover here. Um, tell us the disposal authority in class if you know them, but we acknowledge that not everybody has um, the same level of records maturity or knowledge as others. So um, if you've got records, but you don't actually know what the disposal class is, that's fine. Um, but if you do know it, please include it. Um, so I have a example I prepared earlier. Okay, so I'm going to say that I'm planning on transferring the accession registers um, for material coming to the State Archives collection that ran from the, the set that comes from 1976 to 1989 and the disposal class there. Okay, if you hit submit, it's going to start your plan, but you can actually hit the add button and continue to add more lines. So I'm going to add another line and you can see it has appeared down here. In this instance, I'm going to select a digital record set um, and it gives you a bit of a description about the different digital formats. I'm going to select that I've got um, records in an electronic records management system. Um, you notice here, and I didn't call it out before, but there is a little box we've got here saying no intention to transfer. Now you might have material that's required as state archives that you're still actively referring to. You might have material where you maintain your own collection and you are not um, planning on transferring it into the State Archives collection proper, um, or you might actually know you've got State Archives, you want to transfer them one day, but you actually are not planning on doing it in this five year cycle. We have got this box here, so you can click no intention to transfer and you'll see that that date box disappears for you. Um, current location, we still would be interested in knowing what records you do have at State Archives, even if you have no intention to transfer. So this is part of that information gathering that we're keen to do in this first round of the transfer plans. Um, so it asks you for the different locations or where that digital record material is currently stored. Have you got it saved on hard drive, hardware, such as on a USB or a um, hard drive or on CD-ROMs? Um, is it on your local network drive somewhere? Is it stored with New South Wales GovDC? And we've been asked about that. So some people aren't aware that GovDC is the New South Wales Government Data Centre that does provide storage for government in New South Wales. Or have you got it stored um, off-site or in cloud storage with AWS or something like that? Um, I'm going to say that the location of this is currently with GovDC. The condition of these records is, I'm going to say that these are currently in use, hence the reason I have no intention to transfer them at the moment. Um, but we do know the other option is legacy systems. So a lot of you are holding on to old legacy systems. Um, digital quantity in gigabytes. Again, we've just got the information, just an estimate of the size of the gigabytes. So I might say six gigabytes. And then a description of the records again. So. Let me just get the example I prepared earlier with no typos in it. Okay, so this is our CM files relating to the approval to transfer material into the State Archives collection 
from 2000 to 2010 and I've got the disposal class there. So you can keep going in and adding lines as you go. I'm going to submit this plan now just to show you what happens. Okay, so the transfer plan's been submitted. Now if I go back to home and if I go back into transfer plans, you'll see that it appears here as this is the transfer plan. When you open it up, you have got a couple more things that you can do. Um, it gives you a summary of you're planning on transferring zero gigabytes of material at the moment, and you're planning on transferring two um, metres of physical records at the moment. By you, I mean us and Museums of History. Um, Martin's the authorising officer. I'm the contact who's gone in to put the information in. You can click and drag or upload a file. If you've had a um, conservation report done, or if you've done conservation work on some of your records and you're worried, oh, they look a bit, they look a bit dirty, but we know that they they've been remediated. You can upload that for us. Um, you can provide us a list if you'd like to. If you've had a consultant come in and do an assessment of your records holdings and identify the archives, you could also apply that as well. I would just hesitate to say that that doesn't automatically create the line items in the system, but feel free to provide whatever information you would like to us. Um, and you can see down here that these lines have appeared. Um, so we've got the physical, digital, you can click on them. And you can actually go and edit them. So you might say, for example, I'm planning on transferring um, the volumes, but I actually found there's another shelf. So I'm just going to change that to three metres. That will update the system. Um, and unlike the monitoring exercise, this is actually a system you can log in and out of and update as you go. So it's actually in your control. The other thing you can do is you could go in and you could actually say, actually, I had planned to transfer this in 2025. You could change the date or you could say, actually, I've cancelled it. It's I've got, I'm not going to transfer it now. My budget fell through the floor and the great things I had planned to do with these archives for this financial year are not going to happen now. So you can also do that. I won't save that one. Um, but yeah, so that's the sort of thing you can do with that. Click here and it will take you back to the transfer plan. And then you can also add new items. So you can either do it from this button here, which will open up the form, or you can go back into here and you can add a line to it. So you just have to search up your transfer plan. And again, it opened up the lines items for you. So you can continue to add to it as you discover material. I've been at pains to say to people, don't please don't see this as something to panic about. Um, I don't know what we've got and I need to pull all resources off to actually go and investigate all of my holdings. We just would appreciate for you to tell us what you know in this first round. Um, obviously it will evolve as we go, um, but any information you can share with us about um, the state archives that you hold and your plans for transferring them to the collection. Obviously the, our, the monitoring exercise question 18 is about the transfer of state archives into the state archives collection. Um, this will just hopefully support that um, in terms of bringing it more to people's front of mind. I know we all know that archives are important, but sometimes they do get lost in the business of day to day. Um, so hopefully, having this new requirement as a once a five year exercise will sort of help you to assess what you've got and sort of start to plan for the transfer of material into the State Archives collection where we are equipped to provide access to the material, we're equipped to preserve the material as well for the citizens of New South Wales into the future. So I will stop sharing my screen and I suppose it's time for question and answers or comments now, Martin. Oh, all right. Thank you, Christy. And again, while uh, I just review the various questions and comments that we've had, <laughs> uh, it would be remiss of me not to also thank you for all of your efforts over the last year in terms of introducing um, and uh, gaining compliance with the new access provisions, particularly uh, that come into place on the 1st of January this year. It's been a, a massive effort uh, mm. from you and your team. So thank you uh, on behalf of us all uh, for all of that work. Uh, which will obviously continue into next year as well. So yes, the more you do, I'm halfway there. Uh, 
the more you do, the more you get to do. Exactly. So, um, I just want to reflect, uh, first of all, before we come to uh, your section, there are a couple of questions about uh, contact offices that we have um, on our records and a couple of agencies who, in relation to uh, the record keeping monitoring exercise, but also around the escalation here that uh, people here didn't um, have their contact we didn't appear to have our contact details and that there's been changes of staff and so on. Yeah. Um, certainly from a static records perspective, um, if you can update us with any details of changed staff or senior responsible officers, there's an email address that's been put into the chat, the Gov Record Static Records um, email address for you to record any changes there. Um, similarly, a comment that uh, our communication may have gone to senior people within an agency, but not necessarily um, to the records manager who is online here today. Um, if you need uh, more people added to the contacts that we have for your agency, also please contact us. Yeah. So just to clear that up before we, we go to you. So yeah. uh, Christy, a couple, couple of things. So yes. is there a user guide uh, in, in terms of a transfer plan that uh, people can access yet on creating and submitting a transfer plan? So sort of that guidance. Yeah, not no, not yet. So yeah, like I said, our focus, we're a very small team. Um, there's three of us um, and our focus this year has been on the access direction requirements. So that is on the schedule for in the new year. But at the moment, yeah, until until we roll around to the Christmas shutdown, our focus has still been very much on um, the access direction piece. And as well, we are still waiting for those regulations to actually commence as well. So yeah, yeah. So in terms of the timing of that, uh, the provisions of the Act commence on the 1st of January. Um, the regulation is currently uh, being drafted um, and we're certainly hoping for as early as possible in the new calendar year that that regulation will come into force. Um, that is a matter uh, for us to advocate for that, but also ultimately a matter for the government as to when that regulation commences. So we'll keep people updated on yep. this. Um, just before you came to that part of the presentation, Carly <laughs> had asked about uh, whether the transfer plan includes digital transfers and just to yes. reinforce with people, yes, it does. Absolutely. Uh, as, you, as you subsequently demonstrated. So yeah. that is good. Um, and while we're on that vein, a couple of questions. Kelly has asked about uh, in respect of um, for digital records that are, that are accumulating on an ongoing basis with no end date. Mm -hmm. uh, what's our position in terms of big frequency for uh, people to spend the information at a point in time? Um, so I suppose it depends on if the records are just constantly being created. If you're talking about something like council minutes that are being created digitally and, you know, it happens, you know, Frequently, um, it would be same as the physical consignment. It would be when you're ready, when you have enough to actually decide. Actually, we want to we want to get these transferred across. We know that they're going to be preserved in the collection. Um, it doesn't need to be all of them. It could be part of them. Um, we don't dictate frequency in that respect. Um, but we have had some councils who have done it once a quarter, for example, transferred their digital um, minute books to us. Um, and we do also have some. Um, public officers who have transferred um, some of their administrative correspondence files to us on a annual basis as well. That's not as common, um, but yeah, I suppose it depends on whatever would work from your individual officer's end. Um, we're happy to accommodate that and work with you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, Marianne has asked about records that are stuck currently stored at the regional archive centres mm -hmm. um, and whether they can stay where they are. So. If they're in the State Archives collection already and they're at the Regional Archive Centre, yes, they stay where they are. Um, we have had some um, people sort of, so there's a difference between the Regional Archive Centres do actually maintain their own collections as well. So often the universities has um, a collection of their own archives and archives of the local community. Um, and some of the collection is also records that have been transferred into the State Archives collection and they are sort of holding um, storing and providing access to that part of the collection. Um, there is no plan to move that up to Sydney, so that's not an issue. Yeah. That's not an issue. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, I'll try and get around as many yeah. people's questions as possible. 
Um, Catherine's asked about um, if an agency holds both hard copy records and a digital copy of them. Do we do museums of history want both? And do they list them twice in the transfer plan? So if it's a if you've digitized the records, if you've got a physical record set and you've got a digital copy of them, um, then no, you only need to list them once. Um, we would take an access copy um, to promote access and to preserve the original if you're willing to give it to us. You don't have to, um, but we have taken some digital digitized versions of physical record sets at the same time as the physical record set. So yes, you could definitely approach us about that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Alex has asked about if people have digital files to transfer to big archives, uh, which are not state archives, just long term and no longer being accessed, should we fill out a transfer plan? So, Alex, the transfer plan is only relates to those records that have been identified as being required as state archives. Yeah. Uh, long term yeah. uh, records um, that eventually will be disposed of um, are not. Um, required to be a part of the transfer plan. It is only for material yeah. um, that's required as state archives. And we do also find in the digital space, sometimes the terminology is confusing because you do your archiving, so which is putting it into deep storage at times where you don't look at it anymore and it's just been stored. That doesn't necessarily mean it's required as a state archive and needs to be transferred to us. So yeah, Martin's correct. We're only interested in you telling us about the material that you know is required as a state archive. Um, there's also a question about uh, whether the use of open guard or data NSW is sufficient in terms of transfer. No. So OpenGov is actually going to be decommissioned. It's going to, I believe, go to um, Data New South Wales just as a stored, no longer active system. Um, if you've got material that is required as a state archive, such as your annual reports, um, you can contact our team to organise for the transfer of that digital item to us. So yeah, Gov DC, um, not Gov DC, Open Gov um, is no longer active. It's sort of run its course and it's sort of almost at the verge of falling over, so. Yeah, great, all right. Um, Robert has asked about a list of consultants who might help with identifying state archives or a list of contractors. Um, yeah. We usually refer people to state records for that sort of advice. We don't recommend people, state records don't recommend people either. Um, but I'm not sure, Martin, do state records maintain a list of, you know, agencies who could provide those sort of services? I mean, there's obviously the government records repository in-house with museums of history, which a lot of you know about, but there are other external record keeping um, yeah. consultants. So so state records does not. Um, no. uh, you know, we don't want to be getting into the business of no. You know, recommending individual consultants, um, which of course change over time. So we yeah. don't um, have a list of or recommend particular consultants yeah. um, for that work. Um, Robin, I, I think that's probably a question um, to ask sort of colleagues um, uh, who may have used consultants um, in other agencies um, in terms of you know their satisfaction or otherwise with that work, um, and possibly in that way you can get uh, get to. Uh, that someone who may be able to assist with you. Um, there's also, of course, the organisations um, such as RIPA um, or the Australian Society of Archivists who hold um, lists of consultants um, from time to time. So you should be able to do that. Um, Chris, we're going to try and get through a few more questions. It's all uh, good. There are quite <laughs> a few. Um, so Rhiannon's asked about whether if uh, they enter transfer plans in the prototype, Mm -hmm. uh, will they be copied across when the prototype goes live? Um, so, Rhiannon, first of all, 10 points for starting already. That's a great, that's a excellent. Yes, I have actually had to tell some people, you don't need to do it yet. I've had some, I've had some people raring to go. Um, listen, if you've already done one in the prototype and you don't think it's going to change, obviously we're still waiting for the regulations to be issued. So, we're not, it's not a 100% guarantee that the prototype is going to remain the same. We're pretty confident it is. We don't think it's going to change. Um, but I have been saying to people, just in case, just hold off until the regulations have been issued. But if the regulations get issued, if you have submitted and you're happy with what you've submitted, then yes, we could just convert that across. So we're not going to make you do it twice. Um, yeah, I know some people have been in there and already started. So yeah. some, there are some eager beavers out there, yeah, which is indeed. great. Um, 
OK, let's keep a couple of more questions and we're not going to be able to get to all of these questions yep. or comments. My apologies um, to people. Um, can you add sensitivity markers to the records? Um, you know, if the material is protected or official, um, given that uh, protected records might require sort of more specific protection or storage. So. For the transfer plans. We don't need to know that information that would be managed by your access direction once you're actually at the point of transfer into the state archives collection. If you're worried about us having information about a sensitive record set, um, by all means, you could put that in the description and just sort of say, you know, this is a sensitive record set. We don't want information about it shared widely that we hold this information. But in terms of the transfer plan, you don't need to do that in terms of the transfer that would be managed by you registering and closed to public access direction for the material if it wasn't available to members of the public if it needed to be closed. And that's at the point of tra actual transfer. That's when you're actually doing the transfer. And I would also has I also want to add I meant to say it before, but I forgot I didn't write the note, so I went out of my head. Um, Please don't think that you can't transfer because you need to put something on your transfer plan. Transfer is continuing as usual. Um, and just because you put it on your transfer plan and say, I'm going to transfer this in, you know, the 25, 26 financial year. But if something changes, by all means, transfer to us. The transfer plan doesn't actually dictate um, your ability to transfer to us. So you can still continue to transfer. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else to add to that, but yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I might just do one last question. And what I would ask is that if our colleagues, um, either state records or museums of history, could go in and look at the chat yep. um, and respond to other people's questions um, in, the, in the interest of time. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, for Steve, as yep. well. Um, so, Monica, the final question is Monica was asked, are there costs associated with transferring and storage? No. There's not. So if you're transferring material into the State Archives collection, um, the only cost you will bear is we might specify, um, and this probably nicely segues into Elizabeth's segment actually, we might specify that um, certain packaging is required for the material to stabilise it. Um, obviously, you internally in your office will need to do um, the listing and if you're in a regional office, you'll need to organise the transportation of the records to either a regional archive centre or to Sydney. Um, but in terms of in just taking them into the collection, no, there are no storage costs. I know in the past people have been confused by the idea of sending them to Kingswood because the Government Records Repository and the State Archives Collection are co-located on the same site. Um, if you're sending records, if, you, if you're archiving your records and sending them to Kingswood into the GRR, then yes, you do pay for storage because you still control those records. If you're transferring them into the State Archives collection, you still maintain control over the access, but we actually take responsibility for their preservation and the provision of public access to those records when appropriate. So there are no costs for that. So. All right. Thank you. Um, Not a problem. So we will um, leave it there for that session, but as I said, uh, for uh, both Museums of History, New South Wales and State Records staff who are online, if you could go into the chat um, and respond to the various other questions and comments um, that people have made through that. So thank you very much, uh, Christy. Um, that's been a, a very thought provoking and chat provoking uh, session, of course. Um, I'd now like to introduce Elizabeth Padlow, uh, who's our Senior Advisor Conservation at Museums of History in New South Wales. Um, Elizabeth leads a team that provides support and guidance um, to public officers to preserve archives still in their custody, um, but uh, the vast majority of that team's um, time is devoted to assessing and mitigating risks um, and doing physical repair and restoration of material in the State Archives um, collection. So Elizabeth, over to you uh, for preservation of records. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Warami, uh, hello. I'm presenting from Darug land today and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Uh, Irene, can you move to my first slide, please? OK, so uh, I guess I am segueing uh, from the first couple of uh, presentations today. Um, I'll be talking pretty much entirely about the preservation of physical formats. 
both physical records, not digital records. So I just wanted to make that clear right from the get-go because I um, recognise that there has been some questions about um, digital records already. So for us, um, essentially the control and the understanding of your records and what might subsequently become state archives is absolutely paramount. Um, it underpins everything else as far as preservation is concerned. So preservation requires that we understand the physical materiality, if you like, of the records and the archives uh, that we care for and what those materials need uh, for their long-term preservation to remain stable and safe. As part of that, obviously, we then need to know what we have. What materials do we hold? Um, where are those materials stored? Those types of things. The most common material, obviously, that your records may be made from uh, historically is paper. Um, but it, that's in fact one of the easiest uh, record formats to care for on the whole. But there are some uh, caveats to say about that. Um, some of the other records that you might hold and are referring to the, the high risk records that have already been mentioned in previous presentations. A high risk record uh, from my point of view would be uh, audio visual formats such as acetate film, um, magnetic uh, audio visual um, video, um, audio cassettes, those sorts of things. Obviously books that contain leather and cloth, uh, parchment and glass, you might have all of those things. You might only have paper records, but understanding exactly what you do have is going to be paramount in the way that you respond to their uh, care. Obviously, um, from my point of view, as far as the transfer of state archives is concerned, I'm dealing with the uh, preservation of um, those things that we're keeping in perpetuity. But you should consider um, records required for long-term retention um, in, in relation to some, you know, a lot of what I'm going to be saying today. So where you keep things is very, very important. Storage um, is the, as alongside of the material that you're keeping is very, very important um, as to how long something is going to last. Um, and I'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So good quality paper stored well will last almost indefinitely. I wouldn't say permanently, you know, indefinitely, but almost indefinitely. Um, there are obviously some instances where paper uh, formats are more vulnerable. So thermal papers is a good example of this. And if you've got mixed records, you have to, you know, you have to think about those sorts of things and um, make provisions for perhaps copying your thermal papers onto a better quality um, photocopy, for example, that would be one way of dealing with that. The interaction between materials needs to be considered. So if you have maps and plans that are printed on um, highly acidic papers, you would identify those perhaps by the fact that they become discoloured. Uh, they might um, be causing discoloration of the maps or plans or records that are adjacent to them. Um, those sorts of identifiers will help you determine, you know, whether or not something is a more high risk format um, than something that's more stable. In terms of the audio visual records, um, we're actually probably just to give you a heads up, we're going to be um, trying to get more information from public officers about audiovisual records that might still be out there um, and not already transferred to us. In terms of risk um, and levels of deterioration, the sorts of things that you might find in your record sets would be uh, the smell of acetic acid, sometimes referred to as vinegar syndrome, um, video and audio cassettes and so forth might be delaminating, magnetic tapes um, are becoming either inaccessible due to their own inherent um, instability or also because of obsolescence. So these sorts of high risk records, we're very interested to know if you have them um, and, um, and we would like to assist as best we can in their long-term preservation if they're considered um, permanent state archives. 
You might also have some other, other unusual formats um, from older record sets like parchment and architectural plans, drafting linen and those sorts of things. If they're stored well, they will remain in good condition. So what do we consider the most problematic things in terms of um, record um, permanence or the storage? Essentially, we want to keep them out of environments where there's high temperatures because that increases uh, chemical interactions, uh, chemical degradation. High humidity does the same, but also has the added problem of possibly inducing mould growth. So please, you know, consider um, keeping your records in a dry environment. Light is problematic from the point of view of fading, but also it does promote uh, chemical degradation. It's a bit similar to us going out in the sun, if you like. So we don't like UV light and neither do any of the records that we keep. Pollutants and the sorts of pollutants that I'd be thinking about here might come from your storage um, furniture. So try and avoid wood, try and store on metal, those sorts of things. Um, Mould is obviously a, a problematic um, thing for paper, but it also eats away at nearly every other organic material. So you need to be aware of um, the risks around mould. Obviously, after disasters, mould will grow very quickly. So if you do know that you've, you know, if there's been high rain incidents in your area, um, that you might have had a leak or, you know, you get notified of any kind of problem about water in your storage areas, please look at them as soon as you possibly can because fast response is usually going to be your best bet in terms of preventing further damage and certainly the growth of mould. Uh, pests like, you know, cockroaches, rodents, insects and so forth are also um, highly problematic. In terms of um, how you best keep all of those things away from your records, so what do I consider to be a good environment? So it should be cool, it should be stable. Uh, clean, dark and dry. So the temperature for paper um, is best kept around 20 degrees and about uh, 45 to 50% relative humidity. When you're thinking about storage areas for either long-term records retention or anything that's considered a state archive, you really should be thinking about those conditions and incorporating those into, for example, any um, contracts that you have with external service providers, you find out what, you know, how they're going to be storing your records and ensure as much as you possibly can that they're going to be keeping them in the, you know, the, the best environment. Um, some people I know need to keep their records close to them and that might be in um, office spaces. Obviously, if you can run your air conditioning 24-7, uh, that's the best possible outcome. If you can't, just be mindful of trying to even out um, variations in the temperature and relative humidity and keeping the light away from your record sets as well. So if you have to keep lights on in the areas that you store records, then consider boxing um, the sorts of shelves or plan cabinets, et cetera, that might reduce the amount of light that's hitting the, um, the archives uh, while they're being stored. Cleanliness as they say, is close to godliness. And that is definitely something that um, I would promote very well in terms of uh, good record management and um, archive management practice. It reduces risks in terms of pests, mould, um, handling, uh, wear and tear, you know, a, a really a, a high range of, um, of, of problems. If you can, as well as um, monitoring for pests yourself within any uh, storage areas that you have control over. If you do send things out into um, an external provider, please try and include, you know, those sorts of monitoring systems within um, your contracts and think about ways that water can get into your storage areas. Um, we want to try and reduce that as much as possible. So obviously buildings with good roofs, etc. but also, you know, are there any pipes and that type of thing going through your storage area. So one of the 
biggest problems I would say for many public officers is when they experience a mould outbreak. Um, in the first instance, I would say that um, you are very welcome to contact uh, us at in the preservation services area at Museums of History, New South Wales. We would um, like to give you advice where we can. In the first instance, in terms of response, isolate your records where you can. That might mean closing the storage area, or it might mean wrapping records or and or boxes you know, in plastic and setting them aside until they can be dealt with. My advice is to have the items tested by um, a professional. That could be um, a disaster remediation company associated with environmental hygienists, or it could just be an environmental hygienist or mycologist, so that you understand exactly what you're dealing with, how contaminated are the records, what's the level of risk, what type of mould do you have, you know, how does that affect people, and then you can make better uh, plans as far as cleaning, remediation. It might not just be the records either, you might need, if you've got unfortunately a large outbreak, it might mean the storage area and the HVAC system also need to be tested and remediated. So um, as I said, we have had need to um, advise public officers on the response to mould. So uh, if you do have that sort of problem, please do get in contact with us. We're very happy to, to assist where, you know, where we can. With advice. I hasten to add, we won't come and clean them for you. <laughs> um, so as uh, the theme of the day, I think, is that um, control leading to sentencing and the transfer of um, records considered as state archives really does solve a lot of the, the issues, the challenges that you might face um, as far as your, you know, your older record sets or those that are out of um, current use. So going back to the first slide and all the questions that I asked about control there and the sorts of environment that we desire to keep uh, permanent archives in, it really does solve all of those problems. There is, as Christy said, no ongoing cost to you. There may be a small cost involved in the trans, you know, in preparing records for transfer. But on the whole, we really do try and minimise those costs to agencies. And um, our advice is targeted around that outcome. That the, you know, the lowest cost um, and the most efficient and effective transfer processes we can possibly manage. Before you transfer, though, there are a few things that I would um, mention, and Christy has already um, mentioned a little bit about what is acceptable for transfer and what is not. So obviously, um, we can't take on legacy problems that may have been generated um, with, at the public office um, during the use of, of the archive of the record and archive. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the transfer tool has been, um, that planning tool has been set up with the question, what condition is your, are your record or your archives in? We, though, really target um, or, or orient our um, preparation of archives to what is necessary for safe handling and access. And so, as you can see on this slide, um, for a book, the top um, right picture, for a book that has quite, you know, a high level of physical damage around the structure, the sewing and that sort of thing, we wouldn't require you to re-sew that and we wouldn't necessarily require a high level of physical repair either on the pages. Wrapping it in and then um, putting protective boards particularly if the covers are heavily damaged or they might be completely removed, is what we would um, require prior to transfer. So it's essentially making it um, easy for us to store it and safe for us to store it and then provide um, any access through the reading room. We wouldn't require you to, yeah, to go to a high level of uh, remediation in that instance. Mould is one 
thing that we would absolutely require remediation of prior to transfer. And if you think that you have any mould issues on your records, please get in contact with us so that we can work through how we can um, best solve that problem. Um, and I'll just, I did jot down some notes as the other people were speaking in case there was some segues. Um, ah, so just going to some recent transfers that we have had, um, where I, I know we all experience uh, changes in staffing and email addresses and so forth have uh, been mentioned as part of that discussion today. So sometimes you might be the receiver or dealing with the transfer of uh, records that you didn't deal with directly in your um, you know, daily business role. If you are transferring them and they're wrapped or that you know you can't actually see the, the the physical record itself please do unwrap to have a look at what's inside the wrapper before you tick the box it's um a lot can be hidden by wrappers and um, we would really ask people to be diligent around um yeah around ticking the box after they've really thoroughly checked the condition of the records prior to transfer uh, and that's it from me, though I am very happy to answer uh, questions. Elizabeth, thank you very much for that session um, and for your, as always, um, highly professional, highly expert advice and yet layered with a level of pragmatism that I know this audience will very much have appreciated. So thank you so much for that, that presentation. Um, thank you David, much. David has asked a question um, and thank you David I can see that you've been actively asking questions I think this is the first time that I've been able to get to one of yours um, and it's about our old favourite Elizabeth acetate films uh, and whether deterioration can be arrested if acetate films are moved to more optimal storage conditions. Yes so David thanks for that question. Uh, the short answer is yes, but the optimal storing storage conditions that are required for the yeah the arresting of deterioration is really sub zero, so um, lower than zero storage and very low humidity as well. So the next step up from that would be uh, storing at around six degrees, um, and that is used by a number of public offices and um, we use that temperature as well because if you haven't been able to separate your formats out, um, so a, a lot of offices might have taken cinematic film, they might have acetate still negatives, they might have uh, video and audio and quite often those collections do get intermingled and if you can't separate them um, accurate you know with certainty then um, you shouldn't store them at um, sub-zero because the video and other magnetic formats really don't like it so um, but to arrest completely it, acetate or vinegar syndrome yes you need to go sub-zero and that will keep it almost in stasis if you like uh, but I would also say that copying digitization is probably um, the other very important aspect of um, audiovisual preservation overall because um, ultimately it is a very unstable format and um, it will need to be moved across onto yeah a more stable and at the moment that's a digital format yeah great. so Thanks I hope absolutely. that was a yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. A um, couple of questions kind of around suppliers and sort of um, outside conservators mm -hmm. um, and noting that we've uh, previously answered the question around whether we recommend particular records management consultants and, and so yeah. on. Um, so two questions around whether we have a specific supplier of paper um, and whether we have a published or official list of outside conservators. Um, we don't have a published official list of outside conservators, but I um, refer people to the AICCM 
I can put that in the chat in a moment, but it's right, the Australian, right. yeah, Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials. So essentially the professional body for conservators within Australia. And um, they have a find a conservator um, tab on their website and you can put in the type of, rec of you know materials that you need conserved and they will provide a list of those working in all the various parts of Australia. As far as a suppliers list, again, we don't particularly like to recommend. There are a number of suppliers in um, that do archival quality materials. Um, one's based in Melbourne. I might what I might do is put a couple of options into the chat um, again so that it gives you a few different um, options. But admittedly, it's a small commercial sector, so yeah. there's not too many of them to choose from. Yeah, yeah. indeed. And does the AICCM website have that detail on it as well, of sort of suppliers of specific material or just the consultant? Just the consultants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But if yeah, if you have if anybody does have you know a particular conundrum that they or you know of seeking um, a certain type of material, do get in touch with us because um, we're more than happy to kind of um, point you in the right direction. Um, and again, I'll put um, our general email into the chat. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I think uh, we've answered all of the questions or comments um, in relation to your section. So thank you so much uh, for that presentation. As I said, um, given the, given the uh, workload that you have, it's a never ending piece of string uh, that your area has to deal with. Um, so to, you to devote your time to this session, but also provide us with that practical guidance is much appreciated. So thank you, Elizabeth. No worries. <laughs> All right, and we're ready for our next session, uh, which is to be presented by Laura Baldwin. Uh, Laura is uh, the manager of State Records New South Wales, and Laura will provide us with some updates from State Records. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Martin. Um, OK, so the first update that I wanted to share with you is around the Building the Archives policy. So building the archives is a current policy of State Records New South Wales for records appraisal and the identification of state archives. The policy provides transparency in how state records are identified as being of enduring value and therefore required as part of the state archives collection. The policy was first published in 2001, so it's over 20 years old now and hasn't been reviewed in detail since that time. Given the age of the policy and the fairly recent separation between State Records New South Wales and the State Archives Collection, which of course is managed by Museums of History, we decided that it was timely to do a review. So hopefully a lot of this is already familiar to most of you because earlier this year we actually sought feedback on the existing policy from public officers, related professional associations, other jurisdictions, community groups with special interest in the policy and the State Archives Collection, users of the collection, historians, academics, museums of history and State Records New South Wales employees. So a lot of different people. We received 185 submissions from across these groups, and I'd really like to sincerely thank everyone who did take the time to provide feedback. It's been really helpful. With the high number of submissions and the diversity of the respondents, we've got confidence that the feedback we received is representative of our key stakeholders. We've collated the feedback received, and that's now reflected in a report which is available on our website. We also took the comments received and the findings from that report, combined with a review of policies of other jurisdictions to develop a draft policy. And this draft policy has been out for consultation since the 4th of October, with today actually being the last day to provide feedback. So please send through any comments if you haven't already. I would just like to briefly talk through some of the feedback we received though on the first round of consultation. So overall, the feedback we received on the current policy was actually really positive. Most respondents reported that they found the existing objectives that guide the identification of state archives to still be sound. And there's a list of the common comments we received on the screen now, which I'm just going to work through and provide a little bit of extra detail. 
So we received comments that some types of public officers didn't feel represented in the language and the examples used, and that especially came from universities and local government. Um, so obviously that was an opportunity for us to just refine the language and we noticed that it was a little bit more representative of agencies and departments, so we've been able to tweak that. There were actually multiple calls for First Nations peoples to be explicitly recognised in the policy, either through a specific objective or just through clearer inclusion in the existing objective, so explicit mention in examples and that sort of thing. Um, and whilst First Nations peoples were definitely the most commonly um, drawn out in the feedback, there were similar comments also around some other groups as well. We received feedback that objectives one and two in the current policy, which are about government powers and the use of those powers in developing whole of government policy and decisions were too similar, and so should probably be combined. Some comments also just found the language of the policy to be too technical or government speak. So members of the public, so members of the public in particular were unable to fully understand what the policy was actually saying. Some respondents wanted the relationship between records and people to be made clearer, being more personalised in the language that we used and just emphasising that the records in the collection are about real people and that's such a valid point that people brought out. There were also multiple comments about the subjective nature of some of the language used in the policy. One of the key words that was criticised was the use of the word significant. So we've worked to incorporate this feedback received to develop a draft policy for further consultation, which is the policy that's out now. One of the key changes that we've made is actually limiting the scope of the policy to be singularly about the identification of state archives. So if you remember, the current policy is about both the identification of state archives and about records appraisal. So if carried through, the intention would be to later develop a separate policy on appraisal and disposal. In the draft policy, we've also combined current objectives one and two, which I mentioned previously had been um, considered very similar, and then subsequently renumbered the rest of the document. And we've also added a new objective three, again with subsequent uh, consequential renumbering, which more explicitly calls out records showing an impact on an individual. Another significant change that we've made is explicitly acknowledging the records of First Nations peoples, both in a statement in the policy and also uh, creating, uh, referencing specific examples of records related to First Nations people as well. At this stage, we've chosen not to create an additional objective in the draft policy to avoid duplication, but really happy to hear any feedback on that decision as well. Again, this is a consultation draft, so feedback's really what we're after. So again, I'll encourage anyone with feedback on the draft policy, please send it through, ideally today, um, to governance at staterecords.nsw.gov.au or any other state records email address, that's fine, it will still come through to me. Um, and that's all I wanted to say on building the archives. So now I'm just going to move on to a quick update on our work around the disposal regulation program. So another significant piece of work that State Records New South Wales does um, is authorising the destruction of state records through retention and disposal authorities. And I'm sure that that's an aspect of our work that you're all very familiar with. We're currently working towards revising all retention and disposal authorities that are more than 10 years old in collaboration with public officers to ensure that all authorities remain relevant. And we also develop new authorities as required to cover new agencies or functions. So everyone should have received a notification on the draft retention and disposal authority for identification verification <laughs> records, which went out a few weeks back. The new proposed draft authority, which reflects um, actually reflects advice that we've previously provided on our website and is still available on our website about not being required to hold on to either originals or copies of documents provided specifically for identification, identity verification in most instances. Um, consultation for this draft authority is actually now finished uh, and we're working through the feedback provided. So I just wanted to again thank people who've taken a time to submit a response to that request for feedback. 
Another draft authority that's currently out for consultation is that for the records of local government, and I'm going to talk more to that on the next slide. We've also recently had three authorities approved by our board, which are um, relating to the management of Crown lands, the Supreme Court of New South Wales and major infrastructure projects for infrastructure New South Wales, and they're going to be published on our website shortly. If you're ever not sure whether your agency has disposal coverage, please check the Retention and Disposal Authorities page of the State Records New South Wales website, which has a link to a spreadsheet that lists public offices and their current coverage. And you can also, of course, email us at GovRec um, at State Records uh, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction for that as well. So as I mentioned, we currently have an exposure draft retention and disposal authority for government, sorry, for local government records available on our website for comment. And the reason I want to draw your attention to this authority specifically is that it uh, directly impacts a large proportion of public offices. And it's also quite a significant change to the current GA39. So I would really encourage anyone here who currently works in a council uh, to review the draft and please send through any feedback, whether you're in favour of the changes or not. It can be as simple as that looks good or no, that looks too difficult, or you're obviously welcome to give more specific um, feedback on the changes as well. But I just wanted to flag a couple of the key changes that we've made. So the first thing you'll notice if you look at the document is a significant reduction in the number of entries. We've gone from 928 to 118 entries, largely as a result of removing the entries relating to common administrative functions because they're already included in GA28, which councils are already authorised to use. The authority's also been reduced to a two-level structure instead of its current three-level structure. And there'll also be no requirement to retain all pre-1920s records as state archives. Some of them may still need to be retained, but you can now um, assess them in accordance with the disposal authority rather than a blanket everything pre-1920s being required as a state archive. Given the really significant proposed changes, consultation for this authority is going to be open until the 15th of December. So again, if this is relevant to you, please do read through it and provide any feedback that you have to us. Now, this isn't on the screen, but just a separate reminder that I wanted to provide to people um, is just that State Records New South Wales has a new website. So this is the same website that's been live since November 2022, so almost a year, oh my goodness. Um, but we're just aware that some people still haven't updated bookmarks and are not able to find our pages. So just a reminder that if you do have any old bookmarks or references in old documents, just to update it to staterecords.nsw.gov.au. That's all from me, Martin, but I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks very much, Laura. Um, there's been a couple of questions or comments uh, asking about the link to feedback. Um, people have been provided with a link to feedback about the retention and disposal authority for local government, but by the nature of the agencies, I think uh, they probably mean the building the archives policy. So uh, we could get the link to uh, a request for feedback on building the archives into the chat, that would be great. Um, so that feels good. Um, and I uh, don't think there's any other questions um, at this stage for you. So easy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that by the time our next records managers forum rolls around, and you may not be here given that you'll be on parental leave, uh, but thank you. And I'm sure that everyone will welcome you back uh, on your return from that leave. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and along uh, a similar vein, uh, one of the people who's been in the background of today's session, but um, who certainly hasn't been in the background of state records for the last seven years is Irene Schumann. Um, Irene is leaving us to go to data.nsw uh, this week. Um, and I just wanted to also place on record uh, my thanks, the thanks of our organisations, and I'm sure the thanks of uh, everyone who has had dealings with you over the years, Irene, um, all the very best, and thank you for all your work um, over that period of time with us. So thank you. Cheers. Great.
Great, thank you, Oni. Um, all right, are there any other last questions or comments from everyone or anyone, I should say? Given that we've, I think we peaked at our numbers at 270 uh, today for the records managers forum, comments from everyone could be a bit of an impossible ask uh, for us, but any other last minute questions? All right, there appears to be none. Um, so look, aside from that, thank you to all of our speakers um, today. Thank you for to everyone who has attended today. Um, you will see that there are uh, there's a slide up at the moment with contact details uh, for both State Records New South Wales and Museums of History New South Wales. But I would hope um, that through all of the sessions today, you've got uh, the idea that uh, we are here to help, um, whether that is relating to transfer plans, access directions, um, material that uh, physically isn't, isn't in great shape, um, anything about records, uh, record keeping compliance, um, or the variety of tasks uh, that we are currently undertaking. So please do contact us um, if we can be of assistance. Uh, and I say that on both behalf of State Records New South Wales and also Museums of History New South Wales. All right, um, thank you for today. I dare not uh, offer anyone uh, my Christmas wishes. Uh, it feels a little bit early to do that. Um, I dare say we'll be in contact with a number of you uh, prior to the end of the year, and we will certainly be in contact with you in the beginning of 2024 with uh, a new Records Managers Forum. But for now, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.